people who don't have money, poor people everywhere in the world, are incredibly vulnerable to forms of exploitation that the digital makes possible. So when you think about um, policing, for example, in the United States, and you think, think about how the use of AI in policing disproportionately affects minority groups, uh, poor communities, because of the way in which it intersects with uh, profile, the way people do profiling of you know, minority communities. Uh, when you think about the use of uh, facial recognition, for example, um, or surveillance, you know, policing in, in poor countries. I think the way in which we have allowed the privacy conversation and the dignity conversation to play out is that people all over the world who have money and who have power because of their money are able to opt out of a lot of the risks. I think in the developing world, it becomes a national issue because you're talking about an entire country or an entire society that doesn't have those, adv those advantages. And so, um, I think really what we have to do is to recenter the human experience of the digital. I think so much of the conversation around tech and, and digital developments is focused on the West. And when we do look at the rest of the world, we tend to look at these one uh, exceptional stories, the, the mobile money stories. We tend to look at the, you know, in India, we'll talk about like um, digital identity stories. And we don't tend to look at the holistic story of what is the digital in the context of the society um, in which it is launched. And that's precisely why I wanted to do this research, because I think Kenya can teach the world a great deal about um, building inclusively, about building for the future, about building permanent um, um, changes as opposed to just building things that will collapse over a short period of time, about the impact of regulation and the importance of sensible regulation in protecting vulnerable communities and what happens when we don't have those regulations in place, um, about protecting human beings before protecting corporate interests. And I say that not to say that Kenya has gotten all of these things right, but by understanding the Kenyan case, you know, this country that has, um, it's not the biggest, it's not the wealthiest, it's not the most <laughs> anything, but has emerged, you know, as a major site for some of the most important digital developments over the last 15 years. Then it can teach the world about what can go right and what can go wrong. And that's, I think, the most important lesson. I think mobile money uh, has really revolutionized the financial services sector. You know, before the, the first mobile money company was launched in 2006, before that, only 27% of adults in Kenya had access to a bank account, and that's really low number. But at the same time, you had um, the few banks that were present in the country charging exorbitant rates, charging, having very high minimum deposits, making sure that there was this, there was this really large group of people who wanted financial services, who wanted to be able to transact, who weren't able to access those financial services. And so what mobile money has done is it ex it's, it's expanded the, the access to financial services in really dramatic ways. It's, you know, we have in Kenya what we call a dual system, where people live in cities, live in urban areas, but have family in rural areas. And before, if you wanted to send money to someone to a rural area, you had to get on a bus and cross the country. And it's a, it's a big country. It's the 47th largest country in the world. You would have to get on a bus and drive for eight hours, 12 hours, to be able to give someone you know, money for school fees. But now you're able to sit in your office and just click, 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 do that. The challenge that we have is because it's played out as a monopoly and because there's one company or a handful of companies that are dominating the space, that people are being charged rates, poor people are being charged rates to access money and financial services that wealthy people would never pay. You have people paying interest rates of up to 34% APR um, on money that they borrow, whereas this, the bank rates are 14 you know, percent, which is already quite high. So for me, it's not that I don't like mobile money, it's not that I don't think mobile money is important, I think it's terrific, but I think we also have to have the ethical conversation. Are we building these platforms and these services in a way that is inclusive and that protects the dignity of the people who use the services? I think that's the important question.